fact, an awful lot of the things that are said during an election campaign can be neither true nor false, right yes. because they yes. <laughs> they yes. do with something yes. out yes. there, yes. which is a promise about the future. Yes. And you well, know, I'd, I'd hate to have the audience get the impression that all advertising people had your high standards. Um, at the top of the show, you showed my one brief fling at the advertising business. And uh, when these ice cream people's agent came to me, I said, is it good ice cream? And he said, I'm the foggiest idea. I don't eat this stuff. <laughs> you know, I just yes. advertise it. Yes. And uh, uh, so I said, well, you know, I've got to taste it before I'm willing to go on and endorse it. And so they sent me eight pounds of it. And, and I tasted and it, it, and it was excellent. Sorry. Yeah, it was lovely. Uh, you did say, didn't you, Mr. Ehrlichman, that it was 93% fat? Free. Right, and I wondered what that meant. Did it mean mean that it it was had seven percent of fat? It seven percent fat. Y yes, but wouldn't you say that using that expression, ninety three percent fat free, it was a curious way of uh, saying something which, if it were not in the context of an advertisement, would be would have been said in a very different way. We had that conversation, and yes. uh, they explained to me that w given the the limited period of time that they had bought that that was the fastest way to say what they had but, in mind. <laughs> uh, but, but you, given that the, in that advertisement you were trying to uh, give the American people the view that you were more credible now than, they, uh, than you were in previous roles, uh, do you think that was an appropriate, shouldn't you have been more scrupulous uh, if you were going into advertising to see that you were telling them something that was believable? Well, everything in that uh, uh, commercial I had a veto over. I was not required to adopt any particular no, no, formulation. Because I wanted to point. I wanted to be factual. Mm -hmm. I asked for evidence that each of these things was true, and they provided me with that evidence. Yes, but to use an expression like ninety three percent fat free, which when you just ponder it for a moment out of the context of the investment, means the opposite in a way of well, what it's saying. Is the glass it, half full or half empty? Yes, but in that advertisement I, I mean you were trying to uh, I, as I understand it, get a, somehow across the view that you are now a, a scrupulously honest man, uh, even though you, we, as we all know, you, you were not in the past. Um, and I just wonder whether you uh, feel that you, you did that job very well, given that in the advertisement itself you use the, uh, uh, the syntax of deception. I don't think it was deceptive. I, I disagree with you. No, I mean, I think you've got to look at this in a broader context, say, when you write a testimonial. Um, oh, God, yes. If you, when you write a testimonial, <laughs> you don't, you, that's just precisely what you say, 97% fat-free, except you say that he's a, a conscientious person and you admit that he's got no flair or whatever. I think that there is a certain amount of leeway which can't be called immoral in that kind of thing, because the person... Can look you're between the lines. advertising the candidate. You're, no, you're only speaking to one potential employer. Yes, but the I same difficulty arises, doesn't it? I think it's a stinker of a job writing these testimonials, but the only thing that one can say about it is there exist conventions, don't there? If one reads a testimonial, one looks for the bits that have been left out, um, one hopes that the conventions used by the person writing it are the same ones that one goes by oneself. One is yes. not understood literally as... <laughs> but I agree with you, but I think there are conventions with advertising. There are indeed. I'm way, not as you, you, and you the public get understand. Cynical about really? this advertisement. Yes. You the public understand them very well. Yes. Uh, au pied de la lettre, what they at, say. At, at, what does, at, at what point does... At what point does an omission become a lie? Yes. I mean, uh, uh, Watergate well, was full of this. It was full of this whole argument about not so much lying as just not telling the truth. Well, was it not? I mean, I think to some extent you're, to that time. you're correct, and and we're seeing it now in Mr. Bobbitt's hearings uh, uh, all over again. Except the American people aren't watching. Uh, the only <laughs> difference, uh, the the um, so I can't uh, hear it. Oxford. The, yeah, the, stop watching. But the the uh, of uh, uh, testimony is very mm. carefully trimmed to to attempt to avoid the penalties of perjury and all that kind of thing. So one says only what. He can safely say, and uh, and leaves out the rest. Well, in Watergate, how much were were some of the things that happened also regarded as conventions by the people who were actually committing them? Oh, I think uh, quite a number of them. The so-called dirty tricks yes. in in our campaigns have been going on for decades. 
um, well, like the um, um, sending the pizza pies to one candidate. You know, this flood of pizza pies came to this fellow's headquarters, uh, supposedly on order by his staff. Thousands of dollars worth of pizza pies flowed in there. Uh, that kind of nonsense has been going on for um, as long as I've been watching politics. And, and there would have been justifications. I mean, take the Daniel Ellsberg break-in, mm. the break-in for the psychiatric history of an individual who was clearly troublesome to the Nixon administration. How, in those days, presumably if I were meeting you then, there would be a justification for it. That, that was a course of conduct that had been going on in our federal government for many, many years. And the justification? Justification was that the man stole state secrets, that he had delivered them to the Russian and other embassies, that uh, Henry Kissinger felt very strongly that he was a threat to national security because he was in possession of other important secrets, uh, so-called PSYOPs, the, the uh, uh, nuclear counter strategy, and a lot of fear in the president's office that uh, this man would expose other secrets. Um, and so? So uh, it was a question whether this uh, uh, sort of investigation, this break-in, would be done by the FBI, who had done many of them, or by somebody else. And unfortunately, it was done by people uh, very close to the White House. Decided by who? We don't know. Was there no legal way of doing it? Uh, there was no certainty as to what the law was in those days. The you court had know. never The court had never ruled, no. And you don't know. Well, I mean, I know I don't know because no. that's why I'm asking. It you. has never, it has never been established. But you, well, what has never been well, established? There is the, the, the White House is, to, who, is not allowed to. Who authorized the, oh, these people to do it? Who sent them out there to do it? But there is a statutory mechanism now that allows the FBI to go to a judge to get a subpoena in these circumstances. Yeah, that's all a latter day, all, latter day no. process. But, I mean, I mean, did you do it? No, I didn't do it. No, and there's no evidence that I did. Nobody's ever suggested that I did. Uh, my my crime in association with that was after it was committed. Uh, Dean, I, Dean I, suggested you authorized it. No, well he may have. He suggested a lot of things, but it's it's not true. Uh, my crime was in failing to turn these fellows over to the police when I learned about it. But I, I sense. I mean, I may be quibbling, but I sense that. It isn't necessarily, in those days, it wouldn't necessarily have been a, a moral defense that you have mounted. It wouldn't have been something necessarily that you wouldn't have done. No, it, it, it was considered perfectly legal by the Attorney General. And uh, he was the President's legal advisor in those days. And was a matter of, what, four or five years before the court finally held that it was illegal. It was considered legal to break into the chaps. House and Office, yes. Office. Yes. Office and, and as a matter of fact, the FBI did a lot of that kind of thing up to that point, into embassies, into uh, citizens' homes, and that kind of thing, where national security was involved. And the uh, uh, Justice Department considered that one of the available procedures that they had.